If I were to challenge you to destroy an underground concrete bunker 50 feet beneath the surface, how would you do it? Weird question, I know. Like, how would you even start with such a question? The United States Air Force encountered this head-scratcher of a dilemma during Operation Desert Storm. Their mission was to penetrate and destroy a bunker, sheltering Iraq's high-ranking intelligence and command officers. However, an operation of such magnitude has never been attempted before, and there was no available weapon at the time that was suitable for such a task. Leave it to science and man's ingenuity to devise a weapon strong enough to pierce through 50 feet of earth and destroy a concrete bunker. A weapon created over the course of four weeks with enough firepower to make even Saddam Hussein yield defeat and surrender. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today, we'll be going over the incredibly powerful bomb that was constructed within a matter of weeks known as the GBU-28. Before we dig deeper, how about a short history lesson? Saddam Hussein, former revolutionary and fifth president of Iraq, launched an invasion of Kuwait in August 1990. The goal was to occupy and annex the nation of Kuwait to gain access to the country's massive oil reserves. Moreover, this was Saddam's way of absolving Iraq of the loan lent by Kuwait, the same loan that Iraq used to finance its war against their neighbor Iraq in the 1980s. In response, various nations established economic sanctions to deter Iraq, which proved woefully ineffective. This prompted the U.S. and 35 other nations to join forces and form a coalition to combat Iraq. The coalition launched a series of air campaigns that targeted locations deemed vital to Iraq's operations. However, the coalition hit another roadblock as many of Iraq's invading troops and commanding officers retreated to 40 underground bunkers, shielding them from the bombardment of airstrikes and putting a wrench on the entire operation. Not even bunker busters like the BLU-109 could penetrate these bunkers. The BLU-109 are hardened penetration bombs designed to pierce through 4 to 6 feet of reinforced concrete. The bunker's unreachable underground location renders the BLU-109 useless for this particular situation. The coalition needed a weapon and they needed it fast. The Air Force sought the help of the country's best and brightest to come up with a solution. The research team was composed of brilliant engineers from the Air Force and Lockheed Missiles and Space Company who were responsible for the design and development of the BLU-109. The team quickly began working on a new weapon capable of decimating Iraq's underground bunkers. The team considered multiple options from a souped-up version of the BLU-109 to unmanned hypersonic aircraft. However, the team had a limited time frame and the development of these ideas would take months. So they turned to history and suggested dropping a bomb from a high-altitude aircraft. The force from the height of the drop would have been powerful enough to penetrate and even level the bunker completely. Not a bad idea, if I do say so myself. Of course, dropping a bomb to pierce through 50 feet of rock is easier said than done. The explosive required a casing strong enough to pierce through the surface without destroying the bomb in the process. It just so happened that the 8-inch barrels of a howitzer are made of the perfect material. The research team sought the help of Waterfleet Arsenal to refurbish howitzer barrels into bombs. At this point, the bomb's design has yet to be finalized, so the team was doing some serious crunch time in designing and constructing the bomb while briefing the top brass on the bomb's unfinished designs. The team was actively modifying the bomb's design and specifications as it was being produced. At the same time, the team was working on the clock to produce the explosive pellets, book wind tunnel time, and transport BLU-109 nose cones to Waterfleet Arsenal. The howitzer barrel was stripped down of external equipment and reduced to the size specifications handed by the Lockheed engineers. The chrome plating was stripped and the rifling inside the barrel was machined. All of this were done just as modifications were being administered via telephone calls. 
While the bomb casing was being constructed, a team of engineers at the Eglin Air Base was simultaneously gearing up to conduct a series of tests for the bomb. The air base was set to deliver two test rounds and another two operational rounds in just two weeks. After the bomb casing's construction, the nose cone of the BLU-109 was carefully machined to fit with the specifications of the bomb casing. Several wing attachment apertures were machined into the bomb casing, while the retrofitted BLU-109 nose cone was attached to the casing via a lengthy and strenuous welding process. Just like that, the bomb casing was finished. It was estimated that 15 design changes were implemented while the bomb casing was in active construction. It was also decided that the bomb would be carried and transported by F-111 fighter jets. The fact that the bomb casing was completed despite lacking a final design is a testament to the impressive demonstration of teamwork, dedication, and unparalleled ingenuity that took to complete the bomb. The newly painted first round was quickly loaded on board a C-130 cargo plane, all while the paint was still wet. The second round was delivered shortly after, while construction of the third and fourth rounds began immediately back at Waterfleet Arsenal. Engineers at the Eglin Air Force Base began working on the bomb casing as it arrived. The size of the bomb casing prevented it from fitting inside the available facilities, so the engineers had to work on the bomb casing outside. The first round was filled with concrete, while the second round was loaded with molten explosives over a 37-hour period. Next, the nose cone was outfitted with a laser-guided attachment and stabilizer fins were attached to the body. And voila! The GBU-28 was born. The GBU-28 was finally ready. On February 24, 1991, an inert GBU-28 prototype was loaded onto an F-111 fighter and dropped at the Nevada desert. The result was nothing short of incredible. The prototype effortlessly pierced through 100 meters of rock where it remains to this day. The next test was a rocket sled test at Holoman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The GBU-28 prototype was launched horizontally via a rocket sled directly into a stack of 22-foot thick steel reinforced concrete slabs. The GBU-28 completely decimated the concrete slabs and was found half a mile away from the slabs. The two tests effortlessly showed the awesome destructive capabilities of the GPU-28. Needless to say, the top brass were very pleased with the GBU-28's incredible groundbreaking firepower, so much so that the third and fourth rounds were immediately shipped to Saudi Arabia for their very first live operation. Iraq's higher-ups didn't know what hit them, literally, as Iraq's forces would soon be acquainted with the U.S. newest and baddest bunker buster. On February 27, 1991, Two rounds of GBU-28 were dropped by F-111 fighters on top of a command and control bunker suspected to be sheltering commanding officers of Iraq's armed forces. The first round missed the target while the second one was a bullseye. Bomb assessment photos later confirmed that the second round flawlessly pierced the bunker. You can even see clouds of dust blowing out of the bunker's external vents as the bomb pierced the bunker. With only a single round, the U.S. proved its dominance against Iraq. The GBU-28 was so powerful that it is rumored to have been the decisive strike that sealed Iraq's decision to surrender and retreat from Kuwait. Whether or not it's the truth is up to anyone's guess. What is true is that no one can hide from the GBU-28. Did you enjoy this video? Know any more awesome weapons you'd like us to cover? Feel free to share your thoughts with us in the comments. As always, don't forget to subscribe to discover more and experience more.